So super um, awesome to be here. Um, I want to thank the folks from Muda who have just been super sweet and made this whole um, exhibit and the situation really lovely from the moment I was picked up at the airport um, to just all of the kind of setup every day, every, each uh, member of the team has cooked a meal and it's been like usually you come somewhere to install and it's like, I don't know, you eat pizza or takeout or something and it's just been these like home family meals here and it's just, this place is really lovely and uh, I'm, it makes me very happy that a place like this exists in the world and I feel really super honored to be a part of it. Um, and I'm very excited to be here. I'm gonna talk for a, about an hour um, about my work and my practice and, um, and then I'm happy to open it up for questions and hang out and um, we're still in the kind of like last, I think most of all the projects are up and running but we're still, tonight we'll be kind of hustling and we have an opening tomorrow. But some of the stuff that will be here as part of the exhibit we'll, we'll talk about. Um, okay, so a uh, quick introduction to myself. Um, I used to look like this. So I studied fine arts, uh, painting and printmaking, and I had to get a job. And everybody was doing web design. And it was web 1.0. And all my um, friends were talking about Y2K and the world is going to end in the year 2000. And I got a job doing design. And I completely lied. I had no experience. I spent all my time in the printmaking studio. Um, but what happened is that I discovered you could buy these books. So you could go to the bookstore and spend $50 and get a book about Photoshop and a book about Illustrator. And I started learning these tools. And I learned a tool called Flash. How many of you remember Flash? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I, what was amazing about Flash is that you could write code. And so I learned, I think it was uh, action script it was like Flash 4, so it's programming in this tiny box, this tiny window. But the, even the idea that you could take a rectangle and just say the position equals the position plus one, and it starts to move across the screen. And then you say, if the position is greater than 1,000, position equals zero. Just this tiny moment of writing a line of code to see something move it made me really um, excited about animation and, and coding. Um, I do all kinds of projects. I tend to divide my time evenly in thirds, doing teaching, artwork, and commercial work. So I'm going to show some projects tonight which are commercial, some artworks, et cetera, um, and talk about teaching. So this is a commercial project that we did with Toyota. Um, Toyota has this small smart cars. People th can't think that you can't drive them quickly. And we took put colored dots on the top of it and hired a stunt driver to drive letters of the alphabet and made a font. Uh, out of driving. So we kind of tracked the car from above and then made a typeface out of, um, out of driving. This is an outdoor projection that we did in New Zealand. And most building projection projects, they involve, um, you sort of see the building fall apart and come back together and they're very much about kind of effect. And we really want to use the body and amplify the body. So for this project, you come and you use your body and then you see yourself as a creature or as a kind of character um, you know, five or six stories high. A lot of times I work on extremely weird things. This, I'm um, collaborating with my friend Daito Manabe. We were hanging out in a hotel in Belgrade um, working on software that tracks the face and then projects on the face at the same time. So as you move the face, um, you know, objects kind of fall and, and there's physics, they bounce off your face. Um, and this was the two in the morning in this hotel lobby, and you can, I can't imagine what people in the hotel were thinking when they saw us. Um, this is a project from a long time ago. So this is a person who really means a lot to me, Golan Levin. Um, the two of us were collaborating. He was my professor when I went to study at Parsons, and the two of us started working together. Um, this is a performance that we do called Manual Input Sessions. And it's combining an overhead projector and a digital projector. So using two sources of light, uh, an analog source of light and a digital source of light, and mixing them to create a kind of hybrid uh, illusion.
Um, and uh, when, in order, we were doing a lot of projects. This was in the early 2000s. Um, audiovisual works like performances with singers where we were visualizing their voice. And, um, and out of this research, we were using, uh, we were coding, but we were using tools that were not open source. We were using a library of code that was um, at MIT, developed at MIT in the Media Lab, but it was not, uh, we couldn't really share the code for any of these projects that we were doing. And I was teaching at the time at Parsons, and I wanted to share the research, as, a, as an artist, I wanted to share some of the research that we were doing when we were out making these works. So um, I helped create a tool called Open Frameworks, and Open Frameworks is basically um, a collection of code. It's a C++ library of kind of pieces that you can put together to make interesting projects. And one of my favorite projects uh, made with Open Frameworks is by an artist named Chris Segru. And for this project, um, she, uh, it's called Delicate Boundaries, and she created an installation where there's a, a screen, and there are these creatures swimming on the screen. And when you put your hand up to the screen, the creatures actually come off the screen onto your hand. And we always talk about artwork leaving the screen, and this is the perfect example of how, making an artwork that actually comes off the screen and something physical, something that you can hold and it really becomes part of your body. And we were installing, many years ago, I was in a group show where I had a project and she had this there. And it was an early version of the software and it had a bug in it um, where it would get slower and slower and the creatures would die over time. And by the end of the night, there was just one of these creatures on the screen and it was moving really slow, like five frames per second. And there were these kids that were just, like had their hands out waiting. And it was, it was so beautiful, such a beautiful project. Um, I, as an artist, I, so my background's in fine arts. I studied, I just spent all my time, you know, drawing and in the printmaking studio doing woodcuts and etching, lithography. And I love drawing and I get really frustrated drawing with the computer. And a lot of the um, projects that I make are sort of new types of drawing tools where I would create software in order to draw in a new way um, using computers and technology. So I'm gonna walk you through some different drawing related projects. Some older stuff and drawn is one of the projects that we're exhibiting here. This is a performance where I would be on stage painting and the audience can see what I'm painting behind me. And it's inspired by uh, Thomas Edison and John Stuart Blackton. This is called The Enchanted Drawing from 1905. And here they use a stop camera technique to create the illusion of a drawing coming off of a piece of paper. Or the Portuguese artist Helena Almeida. Helena Almeida would paint on top of photographs. So she here, she paints blue dots, she picks it up, she eats it, and she cries blue tears. And I love the idea of paint as something physical, as something you could touch and hold. Um, so I did a performance where I'm on stage painting and then I can touch it and, and hold it and move it. I don't know what she's saying, so. And we were touring, we had this project, we were touring around Japan. I worked with a Japanese musician named Pardon Kimura. And after every performance, the audience would come up and they would want to try it. They were like, because it's a bit like a magic show. So I decided to make a version for people to try themselves. And as an artist, I really like going back and forth between doing performances where I'm on stage, kind of taking you on a journey where it's a real structure of time. You know, time is really well structured and there's a kind of arc or an uh, installation where I'm inviting you to become a performer. So I'm kind of creating a tool and then inviting uh, participants to actually step up and perform and, and really kind of play with these same, um, these same systems. So this is an installation where you can come and paint. Um, and this project's about a decade old, so it's been really um, 
by almost like archaeology to get it up and running here. Um, it's really so crazy. Like it's, uh, it's been, I've had so much nostalgia to be here installing it again. So I'm quite, quite excited. Um, and one of the things that I love about this project when I was watching people interact with it is this thing which I call the open mouth phenomenon. So I want you to pay attention to this girl. This is in a festival for children at Cinekid. So this is number one, number two, number three, number four. And this is like what, you know, people always say like, what is your artist statement? Like how could you describe your art? What is your vision? What do you, you know? And I always just wanna show this picture. Like I think this picture for me is a really good uh, embodiment of an artist statement to say that what I want to do as an artist is create moments of wonder and to open people's mouths. And that if you open somebody's mouth, it's a, you can make a pathway to their heart. Um, I'm going to show some other drawing-related projects. This is a project that mean, really means a lot to me. It's also maybe, it's almost about 10, 10 years old. Um, this is a project created um, with a group of people. So Chris Agru, she made those bugs that come off the screen onto your hand. And Theo Watson, and the three of us have collaborated on Open Frameworks, this toolkit for artists. And Evan Roth and James Potterly of the Graffiti Research Lab, looking at the intersection of graffiti and technology. And we collaborated with a sixth artist named Tempt. Tempt is an old school graffiti artist from LA. So he's really well known in Southern California, Southern California graffiti culture. And he, um, over, a, you know, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 years ago, he uh, fell over and was diagnosed with a disease called a ALS. I don't, it's, in, in America, we call it Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't know if you have a name for it here, but it's a disease which attacks your muscles. So he's completely paralyzed. He's um, on a machine that helps him breathe, a ventilator. And we just went out to meet him uh, and show him this kind of media art stuff that we do. We didn't really know what to expect. This couple invited us out to come and see him. And we went, to, went there, got to know him, got to know his family and his caregivers, and then made pro a project uh, uh, with him together called iWriter. When we went out there, he had this um, commercial eye tracking system. So he's saying, dude, my hardware is ghetto, because it's basically like a speak and spell. He stares at, at um, the letters on the screen, and if he looks long enough, he can type messages and then uh, speak you know, through this system. Um, but he couldn't do what he loved, which is draw and, and make graffiti. Um, sure, and as a special unit, uh, my son Tony, uh, as you know, is Tim. Tim 1 uh, is there because he suffers from Lou Gehrig's disease. He's in an advanced stage of Lou Gehrig's disease, otherwise referred to as AOS. He uh, is not able to move. Uh, his limbs, or eat, or talk, or uh, move any part of his body, uh, and so. Uh, but however, his brain is wide awake, and he's just full of ideas and full of creativity. And uh, so, it's um, fortunate that you guys have entered into his life at this point in time. And what we tried to do is, as, as a group, learn as much as we could about eye tracking. So thinking like from the camera, what can we sense about the eye and the pupil, how the eye is moving. We also hacked his system, his computer, and figured out how to you know, put our software on it and make drawing software that would be based on eye movements, just to learn how commercial eye tracking systems work. And we developed and published a set of instructions for if you want to make an eye tracking system. So these commercial systems are very expensive you know, five to $10,000, but we publish instructions, open source, open hardware, um, for making an eye, eye tracking system out of pieces that you could find on the street. So this is what our um, system looked like. We went through several iterations, and we really focus on the hardware and the software um, in, in eye tracking. So this is our Kanye um, eye tracker. It didn't work very well, but, uh, and, uh, um, and, but also for this project, we really focus specifically on temp. So most times when you think about software, you think about designing like something like Photoshop or Microsoft Word, software designed for lots of people. But this was software that's really specifically designed for one person. And so we were thinking a lot about his style and his love of letter forms and how could we create software specifically for him. And this is what it looks like when he's using the iWriter system. In order to draw, it's a bit like Illustrator. If you stare at the screen long enough, it's like clicking the mouse. And from those clicks, you can make lines. From those lines, you can make letters. <laughs> 
And once we had a system where he could draw, we were thinking, what is the next step? And the next step was to actually go outside and project his drawings live. So we had to develop a technology which we call GML, Graffiti Markup Language. And we communicate the, graffiti, the drawings that he makes from the hospital room, we communicated them over the internet. And we're out on the streets, and we don't have permission from anybody. So if the cops come, we have to pack up quickly and get out of there. Um, here, actually, you can see this is uh, before we had the kind of illustrator, we had it more like Photoshop, like he would draw just using his pupil. And it was so beautiful, the, the writers, the graffiti writers that he um, you know, would, would uh, work with were like amazed because his style was still there, right? Even with just with simple eye movements, his style and his kind of energy was still in the, the drawings that he was making. And then miles away, it will be projected onto the wall of the building. Over here, you can see. And what was amazing is that when we would do this, we, you know, he would make drawings, we would go out, find places to project it, stream it back into the hospital room, and all of his family and his friends and, and would come out, and it became a kind of celebration and a party. Um, it was, re yeah, really like a magical project to be a part of. Um, and he said, that's the first time I've drawn anything since 2003. It feels like taking a breath after being held underwater for five minutes. And he got better and better at using the, dr the drawing software. So by the end, he's making drawings that I can't imagine making with my hand, but he's making with his eye movement. And we, um, whenever he makes a drawing, they get saved. And we, we're taking them and exhibiting them all around the world. And this is our dream, so we always want to try to find a rich person. Um, so if you know any rich people, this is like what we really want. Um, and uh, so here's what it kind of looks like to have a robot arm draw Temps graffiti. And uh, one of my favorite pictures from this project is this. Um, so we were, when we were developing this work, this couple invited us out to LA. And their son was hanging out with us. And he built his own version of the iRider out of his toys. And I love this picture so much because I think it suggests a couple of things. One is uh, really obviously the power of art is you know, that to um, inspire the next generation, that you can give uh, children and people good dreams, but also that there's problems in the world that governments are not going to solve and companies are not going to solve, but uh, individuals, designers, artists, you know, people working together can try to work to solve. And I think mean, there's a real po power in that. I'm going to keep going with some drawing projects, and I'm going to jump into more recent work. Um, I really love um, like, you know, thinking about how, when we, when we have all these tools around us, how we can use them in really creative, strange ways. Um, this is a project that I did with Google. It's called Inkspace. And it's a, an app where um, you can make a drawing on your phone. And as you rotate your phone, the drawing rotates in 3D. So you're drawing, and then you can actually manipulate the drawing as you kind of move the device. And actually, a really funny story is that this, the deadline for this project, I was uh, actually traveling with my family. So we're out in like hiking in Alaska. So I was shooting this footage like out on the, like a trail. <laughs> it looks so weird. Yeah. Yeah. And what I love about you make these tools, you put them out in the world. So I, I, you know, once we released this, we started to see all these drawings that people would make. And a lot of them are quite you know, childish, silly. Um, and uh, I really like this sort of stuff. You see a lot of this. Um, and, uh, but so sometimes you see these really wonderful things, like this woman in South Korea drew this bird, and I can't imagine how she did it, but she made this like, really beautiful thing. So I love making tools and seeing the kind of things that people, that people bring their own creativity to. 
Um, this is another project that I did with Google. This is called Landlines. And this is, they came to me and they said, you know, we have all this satellite photograph from around the world. Is there some creative way that we could have people engage with them? So could we take this database of thousands of images and build a tool that allows people to play with them and explore them, you know, in a kind of intuitive but strange way? Um, and the way this app works, or the, the site works, is that you make a drawing. And when you draw a, a line, it finds that line in some satellite photograph from around the world. So it's a kind of like a, a search engine, but the search is by drawing. And if you draw a curve, it'll find a curve. If you draw a square, it'll find a square. And it's searching through all the images to find a kind of correct match. So as you draw things, you're, you're um, really kind of like searching through the world to find uh, what you drew. And projects like this, like they always have this kind of front end, but then there's a lot of work that happens in the background. So as an, as an artist, I, you know, I really you know, I care about what the end result looks like, but a lot of the um, interesting work is actually in the background, it's trying to find matches. If you draw the letter Z, what are things that look like a Z? Um, and a lot, there's a lot of data and analysis and science that goes into it. But um, in the end, it's about kind of making a creative work. And the second part of this project is um, finding Dominant lines and images, so coastlines, highways, um, at, you know, uh, borders, and connecting them to create a kind of infinite line. So as you drag, it's just finding images and, and um, attaching them to each other to make a kind of endless line. So as you move, it just kind of keeps going. And these are real places. So and each one of these pictures is a real place in the world. And then you can click on that link, and it'll kind of jump out to where it is in the world if you want to explore it. I really like projects that engage with the world. This is a, another project that's about trying to understand the world. Um, I love radio. So one of the things that I find quite magical in New York, where I'm from, if you jump into a taxi, you always hear really interesting music. The taxi drivers are always playing, you know, have the radio on all the time. And you hear music from around the world. And sometimes you'll jump in, it's like, you know, I don't know, Senegal Senegalese funk or something. Like there's, it's really beautiful. I think there's something quite beautiful about radio as a way of understanding or eavesdropping on different cultures. And there's, I, for me, I find radio kind of magical. And then how, how many of you remember this? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I give talks and nobody knows what I'm talking about. So it's really depressing. Um, but this is, I, when I you know, got online and, and um, started to understand computers, like this was, you know, incredible, this idea that you could type in a URL and listen to something. Like, this is original streaming media. I think we take it for granted. If you, now we're so used to Twitch and live streaming and everything, but the idea that you could listen to radio from around the world, I found really magical. Um, and so I did a project, and for this project, I was really trying to think about, could I listen to radio from around the world and do something with all of these streams of, of data? A lot of times when I start a project, I do a lot of research. So thinking about pitch detection and MP3 and internet radio and all of these kind of mechanics of what's happening with sound. Um, and then I did a lot of web scraping. So there's no real like great source for all the URLs for internet radio. So I did a lot of reverse engineering and hacking to figure out kind of where, where what are these URLs for radio streams from around the world. And I did a lot of audio analysis, kind of looking, listening to um, you know, all different radio stations and trying to figure out what's a musical note. And I, but one thing I love about, you can turn the volume. One thing I love about this project is I listen to so much interesting radio. It just was so cool every day to be like, oh, I'm gonna try some more algorithms and to listen to like music from around the world. So then I built software that listens to a radio station and tries to find a, something that sounds like a musical note. And I built a software that just listens to one radio station. And then rather than make a really complicated app, I just ran hundreds of this one app. So this is my version of threading. Is This is what my dock looked like in my, on my computer. I just had 100 versions of this app listening to radio. And every time it found a note, it would cut it up and then send it to a, um, a keyboard. And the keyboard is a musical instrument where when you press keys on the keyboard, it finds that note in some radio station from around the world. The thing about the notes is that they're, you don't need a lot of context to understand the sound. So I'm gonna play you a, just a very short sample and you can actually kind of understand where in the world the sound is coming from. 
right? It's a, it's a tiny piece of audio, but you don't need a lot of context to understand where the sound, what the sound is about. Um, this is what the musical instrument sounds like. It's really cacophonous. <laughs> And these are really from around the world, so this is a little visualization. And when I was working on this project was around the time of the World Cup, so occasionally I would hear sounds that sounded like this. Made me really happy. And then the way we installed this was we put um, 12 speakers in the round. So it was a keyboard, and then there were 12 um, speakers. And the sound would actually come from the direction where in the world the sound is coming from. So if the sound is coming from Asia, you might hear it behind you. If it's coming from Africa, you might hear it. The all, it, was, it was based on the geography of where the sound was coming from in the world. Um, with a lot of hacking to figure out how to do this is what the studio looked like, a lot of kind of engineering work. I really love, we had a conversation with Christian about these like VFD displays. Um, I had a, a salesman from this Japanese company come to my studio with like a, a suitcase full of displays. It was amazing. Um, and then this is what the installation looked like. I can play you just a short clip. It's really uh, cacophonous. This is me saying what I just said to you. These kids are really cute here. <laughs> and, uh, and then you, underneath each speaker, it would kind of say, when the, when the sound was playing, it would tell you where in the world the sound was coming from, so. And actually, there's a. Uh, I was so happy that um, Lab Two One Two was a. Re they were really sweet. They were installed right next to me. I know they had they exhibited here. So, um, and I've seen the the record album for this project. They were ne they were my next door neighbors for this install. So just the, I'm happy to see that they were a part of Muda also. Um, I, so I, I, in addition to making artwork, I also teach. And I helped start a school called the School for Poetic Computation. We're based in New York. We've been going for five years now. We're really interested in poetry. Most people, when you describe what we do, they would say creative coding. Like the name would be create, we're doing creative code. But we really want to celebrate poetry. Like the idea of making a poetic work. And um, in the tech world, there's this concept of demo or die, like making demos of technology. And the word demo actually really easily can become the word poem. So you can take the letters of the word demo and rearrange it and, and turn it into poems. And we really want to make poems, not demos. That's our, kind of our motto. It's like more, more poetry, less demo. demo. Um, and we're, so the school is inspired by several different people. Red Burns is a, which, um, a, was a, a documentary filmmaker. And she helped create ITP, which is this really beautiful program in New York. Um, and she had all these amazing things that she would say to students. And when she passed away recently, they made fortune cookies out of her statements. And when uh, the fortune cookie that I got said that poetry drives you, not hardware. And these were like, she had these beautiful things that she would say to students. Um, or Carol Becker, who's the dean of the art school at Columbia. And she writes really eloquently about arts education and that it's important for artists to be at the table when decisions are being made. We love poetry. You always have to go back to in the back of the bookstore. It's never in the front of the bookstore. But it's this like section um, where people, are, you know, nobody's getting rich writing poems, but people are trying to use precise language in the word, the right words in the right order to describe what it means to be human and what it means to be alive. Um, in the school, we focus on electronics, code, and theory in the service of making poetry. We do a lot of cooking. So when I went to graduate school, I thought we would be like cooking and drinking wine, and it wasn't like that. But at SFPC, we do a lot of like drinking wine and arguing and um, cooking meals together. And then I teach a class at SFPC called Recreating the Past, which I really love. And that, the way that class works is really simple, that every, de every uh, week I talk about a different artist. And then collectively, we research them. And it's inspired by this book 
which I love, called The Art of Computer Designing. I'm going to find it. The Art of... Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> okay. I have a million copies of this PDF. So I found this book. This book is from the 90s. I fell in love with this book. It's by Asamo Sato, who's also just a super cool and really weird designer from Japan. Um, the Art of Computer Designing for Macintosh and other computer users. Um, and I, first of all, I just fell in love with the graphics. Like this book, just like I was completely attracted to the graphical language in this book. Um, all of these things like using a computer to make drawings. But then in the end of this book, and I'm really like, got you know, super excited about this book and studied it really deeply. In the end of the book, he's thanking people. And he said, I would like to um, thank, acknowledge my favorites, Russian avant-garde, futurism, and Bauhaus, whose brilliant typefaces and designs have in many ways shaped my own mind. If the artists of those movements were alive now to work with computers, I am certain they would discover new artistic possibilities. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And this sentence, I fucking love this sentence. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. There's something so beautiful about that, that the, the past is there for us to engage with. And actually, for students, it's really a gift to say that the past is there for them to recreate. And also, it's a, in some way an obligation that your job as a student is to recreate the past with today's uh, voice. So what I do in my class is we talk about a different artist and designer. So for example, Muriel Cooper, who helped create the MIT Media Lab. She had a group there called the Visual Language Workshop that was looking at the early forms of um, typography and computation. It's really beautiful work. And we will study her work and her designs. And then the students have to recreate it using modern tools. Or uh, Vera Molnar, who I just heard is the next exhibition um, here at Muda. So uh, the students will study her work and get to know her work really intimately and then try to recreate it using modern tools. So almost reverse engineer it and engage with the past and try to have a dialogue or conversation with the past. And we were invited to show our work at the at a festival, and they you know, said, oh, bring the school, do something, and we sent them this image. We said, we want to show the code and the visuals side by side. So most times when you see artwork that's made with code, you don't see the, the underlying code. You know, it's like it's there, but you can't really see it or engage with it. We want to show both the code and the visual form. When we got there, all our equipment said poetic on it, which I liked a lot. Um, and for this installation, we set up an LED screen where we show both the both the text and the visual side by side. I told the students they should wear sunglasses. They should bring sunglasses because it's an LED screen. And the um, AV people kept turning the brightness down. And then when they would leave, I would turn the brightness up because I wanted the room to feel like this. And then so this, this were, uh, what we were showing at this festival were the works that the students made but they were created in response to different artists. So we made a zine. And the whole idea that we had was that maybe you come to this festival, you're drinking a few beers, you take the zine, you put it in your pocket, and then the next day you could like open it up and learn about Vera Molnar and these other artists. And people actually, we were kind of hanging out, people thought we were typing, which would have been like, that would have been extremely badass if we were like doing it live. Um, we were not. But then also, when, when the interesting thing about the, the way seeing the code is that when certain numbers in the code would change, you could see a corresponding change with the visuals. So even if you were not, like you couldn't read the code, you could see that this is a direct relationship between the text and the visual form. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And I was watching my students, and they were having so much fun sketching. Like, they've made 50 or 60 sketches for this project that I got really inspired, and I started doing 
my own sketching, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, I'll kind of walk you through one project, which is an uh, entryway, and then I'll talk about kind of motivations behind sketching. Um, one of this uh, project's called Reflection Studies. One of my students, Yuki Yoshida, for his final project, he created a book wh which was documenting all of the different ways you can tell a computer to draw a circle. So there's many different algorithms that you can use. When you say draw a circle, there's lots of approaches to actually computing, like what is a circle. And this book that he created, he showed the code and the visual side by side, very similar to what we did for, for um, Recoded. And I got very inspired by this, and I sent him an email. I was like, here's another way of drawing a circle. And then I coded it to show him. And the way this works is you take a point on one of the four sides of a, of a rectangle, and then you take a random point on one of the three other sides. And if that line intersects the circle, you don't draw it. But if it doesn't intersect the circle, you draw it. And so the more lines you draw, you wind up approximating a circle. You're basically trying to find all of these random lines that don't intersect the circle. And I got so excited about this algorithm, I coded it and sent it to him. And then I was like, let me try words. I tried the word love. I tried a smiley face. And that didn't work that well. But then I was thinking, what if those lines could actually get in the letters and bounce around? Then maybe we could read the type. So I started coding light simulation, how light would move if rays of light were bouncing off these letter forms. And I got really excited about light and trying to, um, through code, examine and express light, thinking about reflection and refraction, and then how it could engage with typography. And I did a bunch of sketches, and then oftentimes those sketches make their way into artworks. And so this is an interactive work that I created uh, called Reflection Studies, where I'm inviting the public to come and perform with my sketches. So the way this installation works is that there's a light table, and there's a camera from above, and then there's all these laser cut pieces, and you can, um, you basically kind of setting up the walls that the light would bounce off of. And there's a button, you can change the mode, where the light's coming from. And what I love about these projects is they're very physical, right? You come, they're based on a camera, and you see your body, right? You put your hand down, and you see your body. And it goes, goes from your body to your mind, and then back to your body. So I love this, like by the end people are not, I, I like work so hard on these laser cut shapes, and by the end people are just like, using their hands or putting their head down on the light table. Um, but it's this, this, there's something I think really magical about kind of going from your body to your mind and back to your body. And I got excited about doing daily sketches. So for the last three years, I've been posting sketches daily on Instagram. They're basically my form of making a kind of short poem and that, that I try to do. I write software and post it. A um, few kind of inspirations. I'm inspired by this rules from sister Corita Kent. She wrote these rules for students. They're popularized by John Cage, but they're, she, they're uh, really by sister Corita Kent. And we love these rules. These rules are really special. We put them on the wall at the school. And one of the rules is rule seven. The only rule is work. If you work, it will lead to something. And I just love this idea. Um, also, I saw this kid on the subway. And he has, a, he has a phone and a camera and these snap spectacles. So there's something so crazy, like there's so many cameras happening in this moment. And then I have my phone out taking a picture of him. And I think artists need to be like this. If you're making and being creative, then you need to document all the things that you do. And I have this one folder on my hard drive, which is called Everyday. Um, let's see if I can show you. And this is basically, um, I can sort this. Uh, when did I start doing the sketches. I started sketching in yeah, January 1st, 2016. And basically anything I do, if it's a screenshot or a video, um, they all go in here. So all of the sketches, every, everything that comes out of the creative work goes in one folder. This folder is kind of making me crazy. It's, um, uh, uh, wait, hold on, every day. Um, 324 gigabytes. Um, but, but I think it's really like great to capture all these things, that you kind of, as a, as a creative practitioner, you capture everything. Um, another inspiration is this, this is a kind of an American reference, but um, this movie. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. <coughs> always be closing. 
And for me, it's more like, I like this idea of ABI, always be iterating. That's kind of my motto, which is that, um, that the creative act is not necessarily about making something new, but it's about iterating and changing something to make something new. That actually the work is not in, you know, it's, it really, if you had to make something new every day, it would be really painful. But if, you, if your goal is to change something, it's actually much easier. I think this is a really good uh, description of this. This is a kid who had to write, I will make better choices over and over again. So they had to write, you can see at the beginning they wrote like a, the line, you know, they started and they wrote like the line, I will make better choices, but, but, but by the end, they got really good and like the L is just a single line, right? It's like just optimized, like I'm gonna do a single L for, for the will. And that as a, if you have to do something over and over again, you're gonna make shortcuts. You're gonna have to make shortcuts. And as an artist, as a designer, those shortcuts actually become your style. That your style are the shortcuts that you take in order to get the work done. So I started doing sketches, and a lot of the first sketches were about light and reflection, thinking about you know, where's the light coming from, where are the walls, and it was really beautiful. Like Every day I would just wake up and say, okay, where, what's the light, where's the light coming from, what kind of walls is it bouncing off of? And I was showing these sketches to my daughter, and she, at the beginning she liked everything I did. She was like, oh, that's so cool, I'm hypnotized. And then, like a month in, she's like, you have to change. <laughs> so she, she's like my art director. Um, and so then I started doing blobs and like blobby forms and thinking about these kind of organic shapes and how are they moving, how are they colored, like what could I do with them? Um, one of the things that I found really interesting is sometimes I would do a sketch, like this one I did really quickly because I was trying something else that didn't work and I did this sketch like really um, fast. And, and people really liked this way more than I did. Right? I made something and I said, I, you know, I was like, oh, this is kind of throwaway, I'll post it. But people really liked it. And I think there's something really fascinating about understanding the mismatch between your, your work and the world. Or to say like the things that you, sometimes you like something and people don't like it, or you don't like it and, other, and people like it. And I think it's, I think when you make work, it's not necessarily about making work that everybody loves, but understanding how your ideas are in and out of harmony with the world. I did this. Um, my daughter totally hated it. Uh, it's a lot of times inspired by different designers. I love this Mexico 68 logo by Lance Wyman. I just I find it like just really compelling visually. And I was thinking, you know, as a co code, how could you code that? How could algorithmically, how could you do those offset curves? And I just got obsessed and. You know, for a month was like uh, just thinking about offset curves all the time and how do I code them, what could they do, how could I, you know, once I coded it, how could I explore it? And, um, and then, you know, I really, a lot of kind of fascinated with these blob forms, multiple blobs. Uh, one thing that I'm really I interested in is um, 3D that looks like 2D and 2D that looks like 3D. I think there's something really intriguing about visually ambiguous forms Forms that uh, they're like, they're easy to look at, but they require some work for your brain to understand. And I, that, to me, that's a little, again, a little bit of like, it enters your eye, it goes to your brain, it comes back to your eye. There's a bit of a dance. It's not, not exactly like an optical illusion, but something where there's a kind of like a process uh, with the image. Um, oftentimes the sketches are based on my mood. So after Trump was elected and before the new year, I had this weird feeling of like we're in a sort of cartoon world. And I was trying to show the sort of like really deep unhappiness I felt with, be, with the election results and then being happy about the new year and trying to figure out how could I express that. So with a sketch trying to show my feelings. Or after the inauguration, it felt like every weekend we were protesting. Then my wife and I were out at um, JFK uh, protesting the travel ban or at the Women's March or just like we were out on the street all the time. And how through software, how could I show what it feels like to be pushing with a group of people? Um, sometimes they're really personal, like my, it was an anniversary of my father's passing away. And I was thinking a lot about how could I, you know, I don't want to do something stupid uh, on that day. And I found this motion capture data of just a single pers uh, person walking. And I started iterating on this motion capture data. And it was a, this individual walk cycle was a way for me to express what it felt like to be alone. That feeling that I was feeling because of the anniversary. 
Um, sometimes they're just random, like I'll find a video clip on my hard drive of like a hand drawing a line and then connect it and try to do something interesting with it. Oftentimes very graphical, just thinking about a simple form, like an arc or a circle. How could I connect them and, and build with them? And oftentimes they start with a simple idea, like this one started with just half circles and straight lines. So everything I'm drawing is just a half circle and a straight line, but then I'm thinking how could I extrude it, revolve it, rotate it, and change it. And, um, and then the work kind of comes out of those questions. Sometimes the work is inspired by different artists that I run into, like Ruth Asawa is this amazing sculptor. I saw her work at the MoMA. She does these beautiful wire sculptures where it's basically undulating forms. As it comes down, it kind of changes in size. And I, I love this work. Like I just, I didn't know her work and I bumped into it. And for me, it was really fascinating. Like I just, you know, and then I, I wasn't necessarily trying to recreate her work, but just thinking how could I take that energy of just some sort of form that's expanding and contracting as it grows and then take that and bring that into my work. And so a lot of times the work is a response to something that I've seen or um, engaged with. I've do, done a lot of work with typography, just thinking about kind of type forms and how could I animate them and make them come to life. Um, I tried with the blobs. This is really, f um, it was like su super hard to do, but trying to say to the blob, like, be the letter E or be the letter F, like tell the blob, you know, what, to, what letter of the alphabet to be. And sometimes it's like a little confused, I think like here. Wait, be an H. It's like, oh, I don't know what to, I can't be an H. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Um, and I don't even know what to do. Like once I have this kind of stuff, I'm not even sure what to use, you know, how to, how to use it. But in some way, it's like, um, you know, kind of engaging with, um, engaging with these forms, it's almost like reverse engineering, like Wes Wilson typography, right? His, his type forms are these blobby letters. And I feel like there's a lot of work kind of algorithmically engaging with artists and designers of the past. Once I have these forms, then I think, what can I do? Um, how could I like actually interact with it? And um, I love doing stuff like this, like actually just hooking up a webcam and then saying, you know, now I have the letter three, and let me try to like squeeze it and see what happens when I touch it. And it's not it's not really there, but it really felt feels like a living thing that you know feels like I'm hurting it. Um, a lot of experiments with like stretching. I really love this image on the um, this Grace Jones cover. This uh, like this is a famous image from um, South Korea. Uh, and I just, for me, I'm just fascinated with like this kind of process of cutting. So if you take type forms and you just like find a great place to cut it, what happens if you, um, if you cut it and then just stretch it? Um, and then, then you cut it and then cut it again and cut it again, and you wind up with some really interesting shapes. Um, often, yeah, this is another one. Like I really love the Beijing um, uh, design identity by Lava, and I was trying to figure out kind of algorithmically how could I make that. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Uh, typography, oh, it's body stuff, all right. Um, could sh show a few more things on the sketches, then I'm gonna wrap up, happy to answer questions. So body related stuff I'm also really interested in. Um, I did some sources of inspiration. How many of you are familiar with Oscar Schlemmer? So I love this. A real pro tip is that if you search on Giphy for Oscar Schlemmer, you can find really great animated GIFs based on his costumes and, and opera work. And they, they're like so amazing. If you, need, if you need GIFs to express really you know, strange emotional states, um, his, they're, they're really great. But I love this like Dada's costume. Um, and really kind of thinking about the body as a, as a, like a, as, you know, a starting point for abstraction and, and, uh, and playing with form. Uh, Louis Bourgeois this kind of like, just amazing thinking about kind of sculptural forms coming off of the body, growing. Um, Nick Cave, sound suits. I just, I'm completely fascinated with artists that use the body as a, as a starting point for, um, for creation. So I, a lot of the sketches that I do involve the body where I kind of use, I have a video clip of a person just doing very stupid movements with their hands. Um, and then I take that as a starting point and I think about what can I do with that body form and how can I um, kind of grow things off of it. And start with very simple operations like what happens if I rotate, extrude, revolve the body, what does it look like? Or um, find offsets, rotate them make something that feels almost like a zoetrope. 
Um, so thinking a lot about abstraction, like when do you what when do you see the body? When do you not see it? I really really like that idea of that moment of like perceiving something, not perceiving something, um, attaching kind of physics, having springs, things that respond to the body, um, kind of trying to express different emotions. This is a, I really love this designer, Keisha Dean Dixon. She does all these amazing illustrations. And she has these projects that she does where she just gets like um, colored uh, stickers, circles, and she just draws with them. And I just love this idea of stack circles. So I, um, for this one, I took the body and I just took horizontal lines. And if you look at where the horizontal line intersects the body, um, there's always an even number of intersections. If you, take, if you shoot a line across the body, there might be two intersections, and there might be four, there might be six or eight. And if you take each of those pairs of intersections, oh my god. Is it okay? That's really shocking. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's not a... <laughs> I don't know what that could be, but I hope <laughs> everything's okay tomorrow. I do, I do have to say, I forgot to mention this story. So I, today I went to the museum here. It's an, really amazing, this um, design museum. It's a bit like, it looks like Ikea, but like all the chairs are just incredible. Um, and... <laughs> And I was so happy. And then I was like, really like, you know, because I haven't seen Zurich that much. I went there. I was just like super, super happy. Look at these old posters and like universe font, like sketches and all these things. And I've had my headphones in. And I was walking back. And like, I kid you not, a, a tram almost ran me over. Like I was standing there. I don't. I didn't see the tram. And the tram went by me, and it was like so close that I felt like this, you know, the wind. I felt this really amazing moment. So this could have been a funeral for, this could have, like, instead of a talk, this could have been a funeral. So, um, but I don't, I'm happy to be here and be alive. Um, but so for this one, we took the body, we cut it in, you know, cut it in with these horizontal lines and then drew it out of circles. And you wind up with this really interesting abstraction that comes out of taking the body and cutting it into pieces. This was Popcorn Man. My daughter really liked this. Um, this is trying to find circles, anything along the body that looks like a circle or feels like a circle. This is taking the body and then making the body out of images of the body. So taking all the pieces and then kind of trying to paint them back onto the body. Um, a lot of different experiments. This is uh, making drawings and then, um, and then trying to like attach them to the body. Um, and then I have been doing different, from the sketches, have been doing different interactive work. So this is a project that I did with Margaret Atwood. This is in the London, in the London Literature Festival at the South Bank Center. We took the text of her novel, and then we, um, we used different moments, key moments in the novel. So you could come with your body and perform like what's happening in this book. And this book is called Hexseed. It's a kind of modern day interpretation of Shakespeare's Tempest. And every time you step up, you see a different quote, and then the actual language from the book is presented on your body. And sometimes you're like you kind of like an island surrounded by text, or you're beneath the text and the text is responding to you, um, or you're like bouncing, dancing with the text. This was actually like the day before the opening. I was setting up, and this guy came up, and he would not leave. He was really like super into it and just kept playing. Um, this is Margaret Atwood. She's like. She was so good at it. She was really like, <laughs> she was very happy. She told me that if Shakespeare was alive, that he would be using a connect, which made me really, really excited. And it was super cool to work with her. It's a little bit like working with Beyonce. So we never, we like, I would send a, you know, an email to her publisher, send it to her agent, send it to her assistant. And we communicated through like seven layers of people, but it was pretty awesome anyway have this experience. And the thing about the book that's, uh, that I'm really fascinated with is that the book is all about solitude and kind of being alone and fighting. And, uh, but the way this project works is it, it uses a connect and it finds the person that's the largest person in front of it. But if you hold hands with somebody, you can both be part of the scene. So it actually encourages you to connect. It encourages you to, to um, kind of connect with people. And for me, I felt like there's something quite beautiful. It's almost like combating the themes of the book through this interactive work. Um, another body-related project that I just did, um, this is for the New York Times. And we wanted to show visually what are the different stages of addiction. 
and how you know how could we show like interview people that would talk about opioid addiction and how could we show that so we commissioned a dancer to actually dance these different states so what does it feel like when you start taking the drug when you go through addiction when you go through withdrawal when you go through treatment there's all these different things that happen to your body that we commissioned a dancer to dance and then we wrote software we you know we um, you know, thresholded it and rotoscoped it a bit and then wrote software to analyze the um, body movements and then um, did a lot of sketching to try to figure out how do you c convey these kind of um, emotional states through this movement. Um, and then the way this worked is it's a, an article and you, as you scroll, there's these different um, kind of key points. So this is the um, gateway, when you start taking the drug, or tolerance, when you start to kind of develop a tolerance for the, the drug. What it feels like to go through um, withdrawal. And really thinking a lot, like the artwork was really almost like art directed by the interviews that we did with addicts. So that we took, tried to take the words from, um, from people who have gone through this and then really use that to inform the visuals. What is it, treatment? Relapse. And then for me, it was really exciting. Like, you know, I'm, I do movement all the time. Like, I'm constantly posting all this animated work. And like, this was really incredible to open up the New York Times and then just have like this printed thing, which I don't know, like, I'm so excited about. And it was really like thrilling for my mom to be able to like buy the newspaper and <laughs> see what's see working. Um, last project, uh, Mosca de Cara. This is a, actually installed outside here. Um, this was originally designed for, uh, in Houston, there's a, um, a building, it used to be a shopping center. Um, so a really beautiful department store, but now it's completely empty. So the outside looks really amazing, but inside their park, it's a parking garage, right? It just like, it has this like kind of crazy, um, vibe to it. So we were um, commissioned to make an artwork in front of the, using some of the windows in the store. And we were inspired by Bruno Minari, his book, Design is Art. There's this amazing spread with these um, faces, thinking about all the ways that you can represent a face. Just graphically, you don't need a lot of information to see a face. I there's also the concept of paradelia, where you see faces in things. So this is a museum I really want to go to of rocks that look like faces. And this is the Elvis rock. <laughs> Different art, uh, designers, artists, thinking a lot about masks and the culture of masks, how masks um, really kind of like are a way of cultures describing what's important to them and of role playing. And when you put on a mask, you actually can kind of perform and become a different person. And the masks are for play and, and, uh, and also for adults as well as kids. Artists that take the, the, the face as a starting point and extend it in, in interesting ways um, or, you know, do stick markers in their eyes. Um, and for this project, we did, one of the things that I really loved is we would, I would go to Houston where we were installing it and we would do workshops with kids. So we would um, go to local uh, schools and work with school kids to actually design masks. And we would laser cut a bunch of cardboard pieces and just hang out and make masks and talk about masks. And then those um, masks that the students made really informed the artwork. And this artwork's made, it's, so typically I use open frameworks, which is the tool that I talked about, but this one in, is, uh, the front end of it is uh, made with Paper.js. So Jörg Laney, who I think is, lives here in Zurich, created this amazing tool for, um, it's a little bit like coding in Illustrator, but in your browser. Um, and we were, um, really wanted to, to make this a very graphical language for the face. Um, so all of the visual forms are kind of very simple, like circles and squares and triangles, but trying to think about what is, how could you describe a face in the kind of simplest way? Um, and the way this installation works is a bit like a poster, where you, when you step up to it, it's just showing you a webcam feed, but when you step up to it, it zooms in on your face, and then your face is like the backdrop for this graphical poster. And we're really used to things like Snapchat lenses, and Facebook and Instagram, all these kind of face um, augmentations, but they're all really about beauty and about play, and this is more graphical. This is more about kind of seeing your face as a, as a canvas and having this engagement with graphical forms that are abstracting your face. I really like, I was watching people use it. This guy had all these um, tattoos on his face and then this like, the software is adding this additional layer. I really love this, this image. Um, 
a lot of play. This is me saying what I just said to you. Um, here you can see what it looked like. And then, um, one of my favorite things, so I, you, when you look away, you get a new mask. So there's a bunch of, there's probably 50 or 60 masks. And um, one of my favorite moments, so I would remote into this software, I could watch people using it. And, uh, and I saw this guy on a Segway, and he would like slowly come up, and it would put a mask on his face. And then he would, back, he would go backwards, and the mask would disappear, and it would like slowly creep up. It's pretty amazing. Um, and it's based on, it's kind of like the same things that Snapchat, Instagram masks are based on. So it's doing, um, you know, some kind of tracking. There's an open frameworks app that's trying to find all the feature points on your face. And then, um, but the kind of creative work is in this visual forms that respond to your movements and, and kind of you can see your face, but in a kind of abstracted way. Um, oh, one, more, one more thing that I wrap up. Uh, I'm really interested in augmented reality. So. Uh, Apple, Google have been publishing a bunch of tools that allow you to understand where your device is in space. And after a Apple published AR Core, um, I saw all these demos that people were making in the summer. And they were to me, they were really boring, where you would just see a 3D object in space. So you, it's kind of like you can move your phone around and you would see like a, tea, you know, a teapot on your table or a stormtrooper or some kind of 3D model that somebody loaded into their phone. And I, I was thinking, is there another way, um, you know, once we know that where this device is in space, are there more interesting things that we could ask of it? So what does it mean to have a camera, a speaker, a microphone, and a screen in 3D and know where it is in the world? So we started doing these sketches that were just about asking very simple questions. So what does it mean, like, if you have a camera and you know where it is in 3D, then you can take photographs and have them stay in the air where you took them. So the photograph is sort of hovering in the air, and, uh, and then it kind of hangs out there. Or you could do take frames of video and have the video stay in the air you know, so that it's kind of hovering where you took it. And then you could walk through it to replay the video. So you're kind of like scrubbing the video by moving through it or walking through it. And this is not new. Like they're, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, Artcom, Artcom, shape of things past. Like, this is a project, um, you know, Arcom did this thing, like in 1995, they put a tracker on a camera and, and, tr and recorded the frames of video in 3D. But what is new, or what I'm excited about, is that it's like, it's in our pockets now, right? It's not a complicated hardware setup, but we actually can understand where, where our device is in the air. This is taking photographs and breaking them into pieces. So it, when you take a photograph, it kind of segments it and into different colors and regions and then explodes them in 3D. So there's one vantage point where it looks correct, but as you move, the image starts to distort and look weird. Um, this is a slit scan. It's kind of com common media art technique where you take a line of pixels and you paint with it. But this is painting with the pixels in the air. So you can kind of take color that's in front of you and draw with it and then see um, you know, use the world as a kind of paintbrush. This is taking photographs and exploding them in 3D. So as you move, the image distorts. So that, again, there's one vantage point where it looks correct. Um, but then as you move, it starts to look kind of crazy and, and weird. And I think AR is a really interesting medium for abstraction, for creating ambiguous, weird images and things that challenge your sense of perception. So you don't exactly understand what you're looking at. I'm quite interested in, a yeah, the ambiguous side of AR. AR is a, is a tool for creating kind of moments of weirdness and, uh, and challenging your, your visual senses. This is recording audio in space. And then when you walk through it, you can replay the sound. And we actually have this installed as part of the, um, part of the show here. So, and it's like this crazy mobile. It's like such a cool um, uh, way to have it exhibited. Um, do a lot of weird stuff with the face. Um, uh, I'm really interested in, I think AR is an interesting medium for storytelling. This is an artist named John Bergerman. 
He's a great illustrator. So I built a kind of simple drawing tool. It's a bit like a tilt, tilt brush type thing where you draw and the drawing stays in space. And he came over to my studio um, and he's like telling a story. He's like, oh, this is the last dinosaur. And the dinosaur is inside of an egg. And the egg is inside of a chicken. And the chicken is inside of a pot. And the, the mom is holding the pot. She's inside of a house. And this is, to me, there's something I think really fascinating about like using a device in space and being able to tell a story through that. Um, recently, we made an app. So we're trying to take these sketches that we make and put, publish them in the form of reusable tools. So we made this app called Weird Type, where you can draw with typography in space. Um, and you can kind of write a message and then um, paint with that message and kind of put it out into the air. Uh, and there's several different modes. They're based on some experiments that we were doing. Some are kind of more abstract. Um, what I love is that people like totally hack the tool. So here's somebody that figured out if you draw a lot of type, it's really small. So they're almost using the type as kind of a particle system. Um, it's like completely novel and unexpected uses of the app. Um, this is somebody who figured out if you take the letter O, you can kind of draw a tunnel with it. So people are like, we thought people would like write messages like, hey, hey, hello world, but then people are like really painting with type. Um, last thing to say is that I do open office hours. So I've been a little slack. I've been doing, so that when I started doing daily sketches, um, I was also thinking about what is a way of kind of um, listening to the world. Like how, uh, daily sketches is a way of speaking to the world, but how could I listen? And I, I um, on the, Twitter, I basically post like, uh, office hours. So I say, I'll I'm be available. And I do this once a week. I've actually uh, slowed down in the last half year, but it's something that I um, want to get started with again. So I've been doing that. I've done it for two and a half years, and I'm, um, I'm almost like talking about it to, to r remind myself how um, important it is to me. It's actually, I actually miss it. Like, I really deeply miss it. I basically, I tweet, I say, I'm, I'm going to make myself available. And for two to three hours, I am not thinking about clients, I'm not checking my email, but I basically, you know, in person and on Skype, on Hangout, I just talk to people. And I really love uh, when professors have office hours. I had a printmaking professor who would, um, every Tuesday, he would, in the afternoon, he would open up his office and he would take this lemon poppy seed muffin and cut it into slices. And it, what I loved is that he took us seriously. And we're like an 18-year-old art student. And he just listened to us and our ideas and gave us feedback. And I just love that there was an adult who was taking me seriously. So I do this thing where I um, go online, I talk to people, students, artists, designers, professional practitioners. And sometimes the questions are technical, sometimes they're aesthetic, sometimes people ask me to look at things, sometimes we're debugging code. Um, and I have this, this amazing, like, part of my week where I just spend time listening and talking to people. So um, I'm going to start doing office hours again in uh, 2019. And if so, if you have questions or you want, you need to, you know, want to bounce anything off of me, please find me in the office hours. Um, last thing is I want to end with this book. So this is by my daughter, River. Um, she wrote this book called I Am Art, which I think is better than anything I just said to you. Um, uh, here, where is it? I, I am art. Uh, here. All right. Um, you enter full screen by River the Artist. I am art. Um, this book is for Apo and Agana and Nana. Art. Art is like you feel free. You feel like you can do anything. And you know what to draw. And if you don't, you look at you. You are the one, and you have your own imagination. And maybe in your imagination, you will see lines and squares. This took a long time for me to understand. <laughs> yeah. And in those squares and lines, you will see art. And that art is amazing, and you are too. Ha ha, hello, stop looking at me. Uh, art, 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 art. I am art. Art, food is art. Art, anything is art. Art, 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 art. Art, 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 art. Thank you.